I've said it before and I will say it again. Politics and Formula One combine like cheese on toast. And we see people complaining that politics and Formula One shouldn't mix, but the truth is, it's been happening for... ever. The whole thing surrounding the porpoising and ride heights and the wishes of Christian Horner to increase the cost caps? It's all politics. And everyone is at it, from Ferrari to Haas. Because, like I've said in those opinion piece videos, it's all about protecting interests. And for people in my generation, the peak of politics was during the 2000s, where Ferrari seemingly had the FIA wrapped around its finger. Several things conveniently going in the right direction for the Reds every single time. Barrichello wipes out Montoya? That's a penalty too! Montoya. And there's other things as well, like those mid-season 2003 tyre changes and the time Ferrari supposedly had a man on the inside for the 2008 Belgian Grand Prix, when a anonymous Felipe Massa was gifted a win. But for some of the older generation, the epitome of politics was in the early 1980s, at the height of the fisa foca war. Now, FISA is today the FIA. It was a separate part of the FIA, and FOCA was the union of the independent teams, headed up by Bernie Eccleston, so it was Balestri and Eccleston having a little bit of a tiff. But it really came to a height at the 1982 South African Grand Prix. Now, the Feast of Folk War is one of those things that I've looked at in full before, and it was one of the copyright casualties, unfortunately. But in that video, I only brushed upon this part of the war because if I stopped to talk about everything in great detail, I'd have been there all day. And that video was about 20 minutes long as it was. Now, the actual start of the war is disputed, but the general consensus is the manufacturer teams in Formula 1 at the time, so Alfa Romeo, Renault and Ferrari, believed that their rights were above that of the privateer teams, which were the likes of Williams, McLaren, Brabham, Lotus and so on. The privateer teams, though, thought they were as important as those manufacturers, and the bickering started. There had already been an attempt at a breakaway series, which is something I might need to look at in the future, and there had also been non-championship rounds as the result of this political mudslinging. But the driver's strike of 1982 at the South African Grand Prix coincidentally coincided with the return of a legend, Nicky Lauda. Lauda was back after his retirement at the end of the 1979 season and was on an unprecedented $3 million salary for that year. But before Lauda had even turned a wheel, he discovered something in the small print of a form he was filling out to get his super license for the 1982 season, the highest racing license available and the license you need to be able to competitively race a Formula 1 car. Lauda's keen eye had spotted something that had been added to the form that wasn't there before. In the past, the license had been renewed year on year with fees as applicable, but this time the small print on the form had been altered to be... well, a bit confusing and also... probably illegal. Now, the head of FISA at the time, Jean-Marie Balestri, had come up with what he must have thought was a great idea. Super licenses were no longer one-year things, but were now term-based for the duration of the contract a driver had with his team, and should a driver switch teams at any point during the duration of their contract, the license would be withdrawn. The small print also blocked drivers from doing anything which might harm the moral or material interests in Formula 1, which Lauda believed to be a play by FISA to own the drivers rather than the drivers be employees of the teams, and effectively sign away their rights. Lauda compared the situation to being like players in a football team, where transfer fees, contract buyouts and things like that would push costs through the roof and the teams would be making their own little deals, with drivers caught in the middle, in his own words, like idiots. Lauda then got in touch with Didier Peroni, who was the head of the Grand Prix Drivers Association, or the GPDA. Pironi then went to Bernie and to Balestri, and they both said the same thing I said to vegetarians coming to my wedding. Make do, or fuck off. You've got two very clear-cut choices. Pick one. Now, it has to be said here that Balestri was actually installed as the head of FISA by the FIA specifically to take on Bernie. So Peroni goes back to Lauda, and Lauda starts making some phone calls and knocking on hotel room doors. In the end, six drivers refused to sign the new super license documents. Lauda, Peroni, Gilles Villeneuve, René Arnoux, Bruno Giacomelli, and Andrea de Cesaris, which was going to be an issue, because two of those drivers in Villeneuve and Peroni drove for a FISA-aligned team. René Arnoux also drove for a FISA-aligned team, but Villeneuve and Peroni drove for Ferrari. 
On the Thursday afternoon of the South African Grand Prix Raw Keek, Pironi sent Balestri a message saying that all of the drivers were opposed to these new rules. Balestri responded basically by banning every single driver, whether they signed the document or not, from the first practice session. So in response to Balestri, Lauda hired a coach and every single driver got on board. The plan was to go back to Johannesburg and have a meeting, but before the coach had even left the circuit, they knew they were going to go on strike. Keke Rosberg almost didn't get on board, knowing that once you were on the bus, you were on and you stayed. Pironi, meanwhile, stayed at the track to try and negotiate further with Bernie and Balestri, while the other drivers went back to a hotel in Johannesburg and just hung out and bided their time. The mechanics, meanwhile, started playing football in the pit lane while they waited for the whole thing to be resolved. As you can imagine, Balestri was seething in French. Not only was he pissed off, the drivers had also pissed off the circuit owners and the race organisers who had been told there was going to be a weekend of racing, and that weekend of racing was now in jeopardy with fans turning up having paid to see something and now probably won't get to see anything and refunds are going to have to be issued and all of that stuff which isn't fun at all. Balestri then said to Peroni that if you don't get that rat and the rest of your mates back to this circuit within, I don't know, a few hours, you're all banned. For life. Eccleston was also not happy. We've been watching Ferraris for 50 years. Ferrari has God knows how many drivers. They come and go, but all people want to see is a Ferrari. They can't see the bleeding driver anyway. Really, I ask you, what asset are they? The threat from Balestri no doubt got the attention of some of the younger drivers such as Derek Warwick and John Watson who had only just arrived in the sport and were now facing permanent exclusion from the sport if they carried on with this strike. But drivers such as Villeneuve and Lauda and people like that told them to just hold firm and everything would be sorted. Then came the problem of sleeping arrangements. What Lauda did was he hired out the banqueting suite at the hotel and then got some mattresses brought down. They managed to keep themselves entertained. The Swede had a piano in it and Elio De Angelis and Villeneuve would take it in turns to play whatever they knew. De Angelis would play classical as he was a concert grade classically trained pianist while Villeneuve would break out the ragtime classics. Lauda did some stand up and according to Rosberg at some point Jack and Melly busted out a lecture on terrorism in Italy. And as you do. But one funny part of this is whenever information arrived to the drivers from Peroni who was still at the Kyle Army circuit. Before Lauda read out what was on the piece of paper, Villeneuve would play the opening bars of Beethoven's Fifth. Hey, Peroni sent us some new information. Ba 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 ba. And Rosberg also recollects that the piano served as an effective way of keeping the unwanted riffraff out of the room. Jackie Oliver tried to bust his way in to ask what the hell they were all up to, and they simply used the piano to keep the door barricaded. So night sets in, and it was time for bed. There were about 30 drivers in that room and not 30 mattresses, so they had to double up. Prost slept with Villeneuve, which is not something you really want to think about, and Lauda bunked with De Cesaris, and I'm guessing that it was an awkward yet funny night. But there was one problem. The problem being the lack of a toilet in that suite. The reason the drivers are all sleeping in that one room is because if they went to separate hotel rooms they wouldn't have been taken seriously. And there was a toilet across the hallway. The key for which was on a plate in the middle of the room, and the drivers are on a bound that if they used the bog they had to lock the toilet and return the key to the plate. It was at that point that Teo Fabi fucked off. Fabi ran like a chicken, said Rosberg, went out, didn't come back, and lost all our respect forever. Not because he decided to leave, but because he betrayed us. He went straight to Balestri and Bernie and told them everything we had discussed. Fabi, though, says the stories of him climbing out through the toilet window are greatly exaggerated. The next morning, though, Peroni contacted Lauda and said that it was over and they had won. The only driver not to take part in the strike was Joachim Mass, but that was only because he'd arrived late to South Africa. Friday practice started at 10am and Mass was the only driver on track, with the other teams said to be holding out pit boards for him. By midday though, the rest of the drivers were back and Balestri was absolutely incensed. Prost won the race on the Sunday and afterwards Balestri started handing out fines and suspended race bans between two and five thousand dollars and two and five races, depending on which driver was involved in the strike. But these were quickly rescinded when the FIA told FISA and Balestri, you don't do that again, you hear me? And then they took out the bit about the super license rules being tied to your you know, race contract. 
Two months later, there was a strike by the Foca aligned teams at San Marino, a story again for another day. And in 2008, there was almost a driver strike at Silverstone when the FIA was demanding more money from the drivers for super license fees due to a budget shortfall and was extorting the drivers to try and get the books to match up. And then there was Saudi Arabia this year when all the drivers locked themselves away to get assurances that the missiles being launched at the surrounding area were not going to hit the track. But what would F1 be without all the politics? So there we have it, a look at the 1982 South African Grand Prix driver strike. If this has been something new for you here today, then do give the video a thumb up. And for more stuff like this, get subscribed and also get the bell on so you never miss out on a future video. Massive thanks to the kind folk over at Patreon, and if you want to help support me at a more personal level, you can help out by following the link down in the description, where there will also be links to Discord and also to my socials. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward. Have a great day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.